Will you pray with me, please? Our Father, we, we bow before you. You alone are worthy this morning. And we want to continue in a spirit of worship. We thank you for your word. Lord, we celebrate your word this morning. We celebrate truth. And Lord, as your word says, it has been breathed out by you and that it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. We beg of you this morning that you would correct us, that you would train us, that you would equip us, reprove us, and Lord, teach us. Father, we can't even have the right heart posture before you this morning without your help. So we beg of you, Father, that you would give us worshipful hearts, that we would learn from the Lord Jesus Christ this morning how we must live. Take us, mold us, shape us, Father. Remove the distractions. Be worshipped now in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning we want to celebrate the gospel. And all uh, too often as we come into this season, of course, and rightly so, the, the emphasis is on the event that took place on that cross. But there's a whole lot of things that happen leading up to that moment. And that's our text this morning as we just read together. And we've gone over the gospel and it's one of those things that I am learning to repeat to myself on a regular basis because the gospel is not just useful for one who does not know Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is useful for us who know Christ as Savior to rehearse and repeat and declare to ourselves the most precious truth in all of the universe. Unfortunately, we are in our humanness, very bent towards uh, putting ourselves at the center of our universe. We see life through our own set of lenses, our own perception. We trust ourselves more than we trust just about anybody else. And that can cause us, believe it or not, to fall into uh, a false gospel belief. In fact, if we Christianize a self-centered gospel, that is basically what the prosperity gospel is. So we come to our text today. It contains no prescriptive instructions for us. What we have before us is purely a narrative description of the trials of Jesus, specifically his last trial. The other gospel accounts also give insight into the events and the dialogue that went on on that day. We also have prophecies uh, that are spoken hundreds of years before, as well as some that were spoken directly by Jesus about his own death, that give legitimacy and details and insight into these events of these very trials that Jesus went through. How do you read a passage that's purely descriptive like this and come to some sort of application for you and for me today? How do you read this text and come away with anything worth meditating on for our spiritual growth and edification? Well, if you have your copy of the Word, many of you have probably already navigated to Matthew 27. We're looking at that passage we read together. There's a few important characters in this passage. Only one, obviously, is worth following their example. He, obviously, being Jesus. The others, we should not follow. But if, if we're honest, if we're really, truly honest with ourselves this morning, 
we can look at these other characters through this, the correct set of lenses. Humanly speaking, we will look at them and go, wow, I'm not like them. I am nothing like a pilot, a Judas Iscariot who betrayed Jesus. I am nothing like Brabus. If we're honest, we'll understand that it's in the very root of our heart and the motivations that we have for life. We have those same motivations and the same guilt of pride, fear, worry, selfishness, discontent, and distrust. So let's look at this together. I'm going to zoom through this text very quickly to gain all the descriptive context, and then we're going to look at some application. Verse 1, the Jewish leaders desired to kill Jesus. Arrest was not enough. If they had only arrested him, his followers would have continued. They needed to kill him so that they could think that they would get rid of the followers. Verse 2, Jesus was bound. He was led away by the Jews to be tried by the Roman governor, Pilate. This was prophesied by Jesus himself in the same book, Matthew 20, chapter 20, verse 19. The Romans tolerated the Jews' customs and their way of life. They hated any commotion or anything that caused problems for the interests of their empire. Okay? So the Jews, they knew this, and they thought that Rome would love to get rid of Jesus. Rome's way of getting rid of problems was to make an example of them. Crucifixion. The Roman law in that time reserved them the right for execution, especially for anyone of high profile. For the Jews to get what they wanted, which was Jesus' death, they depended on Roman officials to act. We can see that in John, in the account in John 18. It says they did not have the right to carry out the death sentence of Jesus on their own. They needed Rome to act. Verse 3, Judas changes his mind. I want to suggest to you this was not a genuine repentance. If it was, he certainly would not have gone out and hanged himself. He did not have what it says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, a godly sorrow. Rather, he had a worldly sorrow. He felt bad, not so much for what he did, but for the consequence of what happened. Okay? Godly sorrow leads to genuine repentance. Suicide demonstrates the kind of sorrow and regret that he had. Verse 4, typically, if you were to show up before the chief priests of Israel, like he did, saying, I have sinned, like he did, what would normally happen? They are priests. They have to go through ceremony. They have to walk you through a process to make you right with God again because of your sin. Do you see what they said? Go take care of it yourself. Wow. Where these Jewish leaders, their mind, their hearts, where, where were they at? Everything is following according to plan finally for them. Let's get rid of Jesus. He's the problem. He's the threat. They did not believe Jesus was innocent. As Judas said, I killed, I'm guilty of innocent blood. And two, they were too busy trying to make sure that Jesus was killed. They did not want to take the time to do their priestly duty. That would distract them from the matter at hand. Judas, just go take care of it yourself. Verse five, Judas then throws the 30 pieces of silver into the temple and he went And he hanged himself in in Deuteronomy 21, not just hundreds of years, thousands of years before this event. It's prophesied and and it's said, cursed is he who hangs on a tree. This man went out 
and killed himself exactly according to prophetic writings thousands of years before. Verses 6 through 8. The priests gather all these pieces of silver. They choose not to return the money to the treasury since it's blood money. They collaborate together. They decide to buy the potter's field as a burial ground for strangers. And if we look into some historical context, we can understand what's going on, why they would choose to do that. It would have been viewed as an acceptable use of ill-gotten funds by the priests. In other words, this was the best thing they could do to make themselves look good in society with that money. They couldn't put it back in the treasury. Verses 9 and 10 gets confusing because you have a paraphrase from the scripture in Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. It says, then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price on him, of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Why does it say Jeremiah? Well, there's a possibility here that the collection of prophetic writings, Jeremiah is the first one mentioned, Okay. Well, you guys are backwards, so it's Jeremiah is the first one mentioned as you go through the Old Testament prophets. So it was uh, accepted then that a lot of times they would use the name Jeremiah in reference to prophetic writing. So we believe that that could be why you have a passage repeated or paraphrased from Zechariah when indeed it was Jeremiah that's getting the credit. Okay. But this is less important, however, to the fact that the exact 30 pieces of silver hundreds of years ago was the set price for Jesus' head. That's amazing. Hundreds of years ago in a different economy. Rome wasn't even on the scene yet. And this was prophesied. The very price. That was fulfilled prophecy. Verses 11 through 14, um, a week before uh, Jesus was tried, these people in chapter 21, 8 through 9 of Matthew, these same people are chanting, Hosanna in the highest. They're waving palm branches. They are worshiping him. They're laying their coats out onto the, the street so that the colt, uh, the, the donkey that Jesus is riding on, it can walk along uh, on their coats. It was an act of worship. And just one week later, these same people are yelling. 